Hello, you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Brandon Elliott. So we have a guest with us today talking about data points for real estate investing. He's been in Silicon Valley for, what, 10 years, I believe, and Wall Street for 18. The last eight years been in real estate investing and currently working with Farmfolio for the last year, but has been working in their syndication for the last seven years, doing a bunch of things all in between when it comes down to buying farmland out of the country. And then also really a a lot of other cool things that we're going to dive into, but it really just comes down to the data points, right? It comes down to not making mistakes and really following the numbers. So we're going to dive into that today so that you guys are educated and, and that you don't make any mistakes that maybe myself or maybe Peter has made in the past so that you can follow the numbers and be educated and equipped and prepared to take action in real estate. So with that being said, Peter, what is going on, my friend? How are you today? Fantastic, Brandon. Thanks for having me on the show today. I love it. Yeah. You got a little accent. Where are you from? Uh, British, but I'm uh, living in the States now, dual citizen. So you know. Okay. Love it. How long have you been over here? 32 years. I made 32 myself. years. I yeah. love it. That's awesome. So tell us, you know, the 10,000 foot view of what you're up to and, and what you're doing in investing. Yeah. So my, my journey was simple. 18 years on Wall Street, drank the Kool-Aid, all about stocks, bonds and 60-40 portfolio. Got a bit exhausted by it. Corporate life, you know, amazing experience. Jumped out, started my own company, Silicon Valley tech company, founded it with a partner went through a full Series A, venture capital, Series B, and then acquired at the end of that journey. And so I popped out in 2014, actually, as um, pretty experienced. And I went on this crazy real estate journey of how do I keep the capital I just made and grow it for the future? Yeah. That's good. So what did you do? I went around and asked everybody I knew in Silicon Valley what they did. Yeah. <laughs> I can do with people. What kind of answers were you getting? Because I'm, I'm the type of person that I really like to, if I could line everybody up in the world to get their opinion on something or to get their feedback on something, not necessarily going to go with it. But if I could just get all the data, then I can make my, I feel confident in my own decisions. Yeah. Are also, you similar? The ama- yeah. The amazing thing about when you sell your company, it was a sub 50 million exit. Yeah. Is it's not disclosed. The price isn't disclosed. Sure. So everybody assumes you made a ton of money, even if you haven't made a ton of money. Yeah. <laughs> the calls are coming in from all the private wealth management firms and all the independent financial advisors and all, you know, every, every man and his dog yeah. is calling you to say, let me help you take your winnings. And, you know, yeah. and so I ended up with kind of two groups of people. One group was just like us. They put you know money in the stock market, public markets and roll the dice and see what Wall Street does with it. Sure. But then the second group, and they were mostly multi-exit CEOs in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And they said to me, you know, the the broad message was, Peter, we make our money in public and private company stock. And then when you've made that money, you put it into a hard asset like real estate or agriculture. That's good. And that was fascinating to find those two groups of people, those who knew nothing about it and those who really were into the hard real asset side. And they knew that they couldn't basically just roll the dice and keep it on the stock market forever. So tell me about the agriculture. They said hard assets and agriculture. Did they break that down? For real estate and farmland. I mean, so 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 here's the kind of the two buckets which we can't we understand real estate. Yeah. It's obvious. Okay, why does somebody invest in agriculture? There's one guy, he he claimed to be one of the um financial advisors for the Zuckerbergs. All right. Okay. And you never quite know if they're telling the truth, but he was pretty knowledgeable. Yeah. Uh, but, But what he said was. People don't realize that high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth or family offices from these you know, wealthy families, yep. they put between 14 and 22% in agriculture and forestry. 
And they do that because it's a non-correlated asset class. And more importantly, it passes wealth through the generations. Mm. As you think about it, a coconut tree, you plant a coconut tree today, five years from now, it starts to produce coconuts. It'll produce coconuts for 60 to 80 years, depending on the genetic. Yeah. It's not only providing, you know, increase in appreciation of the land and the trees over time, but it's also providing cash flow for their lifetime and their future generation's lifetime. Wow. That's powerful. So did they give you the script on like where to buy, where to look, how to screen Um, these out? (laughs) No, I had to work it out and like getting some new asset class. And so there's nothing out there. I mean, for regular real estate, single family, multifamily, mobile home park storage, name your sub-asset class. There is mentorship, there's books, there's people, everything, courses, nothing in agriculture whatsoever. On farms, yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And the reason for that is because most of the agricultural stuff is owned by private wealthy families or large, you know, REITs and corporations. There isn't really room for you and me, you know, the the little people to get exposure to it. So uh, that's the journey I went on. So where did you start studying this? Like, how did you start getting your info? And how long were you searching before you started, you know, getting some traction? I was fortunate because I met somebody who explained that you couldn't make money in the U.S. Oh, okay. And that's because it's large, wealthy landowners, large corporations. And more important, the land is expensive and the labor is expensive. Yeah. And so you kind of like have two things against you going into any agricultural opportunity in the US, which means you cannot get the returns. Because we're all looking for, you know, 8% cap rate minimum kind of thing, you know? Sure. Yeah. And so I then started traveling. I was a digital nomad for three years. I lived in like 19 cities across, you know, Eastern Europe, Europe, Central South America traveling a lot. And I was networking, looking for agriculture. I love it. And that's when you just start to meet people. You start to meet mostly Americans, ironically, overseas, who are setting up farm projects. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. And you meet somebody and they take you around their farm and they show you a glossy brochure and say, you know, it's private equity syndication. You can invest in this and You'll get a you know 30 year IRR and you know it's it was crazy. And I spent the first two years kind of like investing in stuff left, right, and center, lost a bunch of money. Okay. And I then found a couple of providers who were doing it the right way. Yeah. And eventually this company, Farmfolio, I've invested for five, six years with them. And I joined them full time last year because they've got it right. I love it. So for the listeners out there, is is there anything that you could give tips on or, you know, so they can try to limit their losses as, you know, if they're interested, just like you, really fired up to start getting into agriculture and they're getting shown around, you know, by the first dozen people, unfortunately, they don't have it right. Like, what are those key points to acknowledge like, hey, these guys don't have it right and I could potentially lose a bunch with them? Yeah. Well, so let's kind of like backtrack a little bit because I think it's important to try and compare traditional U.S. real estate to a different asset class like agriculture. Sure. And so even my real estate journey was as fascinating because I kept trusting people and the glossy brochures, you know, and the handshake and looking someone in the eye and says, yeah, this this is the right property to buy. You know, I did that for a couple of years in my own real estate investing journey. And it was only when I realized that there was a bit hit and miss that I needed to just start applying my corporate skills into my investing realm, which is really following a due diligence process and looking at the data underlying the asset class. And so I tell people now, because I I know even to this day, there's probably people listening, they've got some brokers going to say, yeah, buy that single family rental down the road. It'll rent out for the right rent. You make money. They're trusting people. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, U.S. real estate I will never go into trusting anybody. I will only follow the data. I love it. And so then the question becomes, okay, let's talk about the data. For US real estate, here's my macro view. I go from an MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area. There's 400 across the US. And I do a top-down approach. 
which of those real estate markets, uh, there's 400 of the main ones across the US, what's the population growth? Yeah. What's the medium house condo values? Are they increasing over the past 20 years? Are the crime rates declining? You know, you've got to look at, you know, are there jobs increases? You know, you have to start looking at the macro numbers, then you go down to the city and then down to the zip code, do exactly the same thing. And so you need to make sure that the, the data you follow means that the real estate you're trying to buy is in the right location with the right demographics, with the right financial fundamentals. It's near jobs, it's got amenities, it's got bars, restaurants, it's, you know, lowering clients, you got to do the data and follow due diligence process. Only when you then have worked out that that location is good, you then assess the asset itself and assess the fact. That's good. So first, really do your due diligence on the location, the, the area, and start off, you know, wide open with the city, then get down to the small, uh, you know, town, basically. The well, and it's a zip code, then it's by block by block, as we all yeah. know, you can cross that road and it's a class C neighborhood. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, the common things is population growth, job growth, household medium income, and then crime rate going down, you know, build the relationships within the city as well. I've done this myself, reaching out to the police department and saying, hey, where's your worst neighborhood? I'm interested in properties right around here. What do I need to know about being 3,000 miles away that I'm clueless and you grew up here, you know? And that has a big impact. There's amazing data sources for free out there. I mean, at a macro level, city-data.com is an amazing website. It'll yep. tell you all that information. Sure. And then you can add certain websites that specialize. You know, look for places with good schools because families all want to live in the places where the best schools are. So, you yep. know, good you know, you can look up sources then crime. You can actually plug an address yeah. in crime spot. It'll tell you how many, no offense, rapes, murders, yeah. car jackings they were within a radius of three miles of the property. Yeah, fellas, do not do this with your lady next to you. Once you start seeing all the negative stuff in your neighborhood, really close to the house, like, whew, you're going to be on lockdown for a while with the kids and everything. So be yeah. careful. <laughs> I mean, my message is, you know, trust, but verify, verify uh, the data, so go through a process. Yeah. So um, then, you know, if the location adds up and then you really start narrowing it down to the, the streets and everything, if everything lines up in a good way, then you start switching it over to the actual product itself, the physical asset of, hey, let's run the numbers on this, the data on this. Do you mind breaking that down? What does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, we can kind of go in the multifamily routes, obviously. I'm interested more on the farm ag agriculture, yeah. actually, oh, if okay. you don't mind, just because yeah. so I feel like that's very unique. <laughs> right. So let's shift over. All right. Okay. Follow a process, US real estate, whatever your asset class is. Yep. Now you can kind of come across to a different asset class. Knowing a due diligence process, you need to therefore ask the right questions about what data you're looking for. That's good. So farming, what do we care about? We care about the location of the farm because to do farming well, you need several key things. Number one, you need to work out which crop grows well right there. in which environments. Sure. So you can kind of like, at a macro level, if you look at like single family, multifamily, you have row crops and permanent crops. Yeah. Row crops are you plant it, barley, wheat, and you get the money back in a year low barrier to entry, it's yep. mass scale, mechanized farming, only the big boys do it. Yep. Permanent crops, it's a higher barrier to entry because you're planting a tree, let's call it citrus tree, coconut, avocado, whatever you want to plant, you're waiting three to four years for the first harvest, yep. eight years for the maximum production, and it's a cycle of decades after that. Wow. So you kind of need to choose the crop that is in demand, that can be transported, you know, what's your supply chain? Yeah. So you just start at the product itself, you know, what are you going to get into? And so here's my success story of all the things I've done. I've done a lot of this now. Where Farmfolio has succeeded and why I've joined the company is because they choose premium in-demand fruits that are being sold in the supermarket to you and me. So we have coconuts, for instance. We have limes. We send containers of limes every week. 
across from these farms to Philadelphia port. They're transported up to Walmart, Costco, Trader Joe's. And think about it, these are fruits that are, you know, they are in demand. Yeah. Avocados, same thing. I mean, how many times do we go to the supermarket, buy six avocados, three are rotten, we still go back and pay that price the next week. Yeah, yeah. San Diego, too. I'm telling you, I've never been to another city that San Diego is addicted to their avocados. It's like it should be the main fruit of the you know city. It's really crazy. <laughs> So, so choose the right crop is my first statement. Make sure it sells well. There's a market for it, and that market is increasing. Yeah, that's, now, that's your population growth corollary, isn't it? Now, is there a way to search that, or is I'm sure there, there's a way to search everything, but is there a certain recommendation that you would give a site, or just I don't know, reaching out um, to somebody? Yeah, number one, go to your fridge. Number yeah. two, what, yeah, what you've been buying. <laughs> number three, you can actually go to uh, there's various sources, you know, USDA. There's a yep. bunch of other websites. You can even go to places like, you know, you can go to the Rungis Market website in Paris, yeah. which is responsible for all the fruit sales in a good part of Europe. And it'll tell you the price of different products historically, you know, what the demand is, et cetera. So, wow, that's awesome. I love it. Um, so, so once you once you realize it's a high demand, then you know the fruit, you know the product that you're going to be focusing on. Now you know, once you know what type of fruit it is, then you can do your own due diligence to see where it grows best, right? What type of environment it wants to be around. Then what? Yeah, so you're looking really at the global view. Sure. Because you can't make money in the US real uh, you know, farmland, so you've got to go internationally. Yep. So when you kind of look at the next path is okay what are the big producing countries and which are the big consuming countries and all this data is public you can find it and so then you find out let's take coconuts most of the coconuts today are supplied in southeast asia wow who knew yeah yeah <laughs> and they have a problem now as a producing set of countries you know it's uh, malaysia india you know Thailand, Philippines, there's various countries over there that have a lot of old coconut trees. And it's classic in, in agriculture, trees go senile when they get old, just like human beings. Oh, wow. But instead of losing their memory with Alzheimer's, they actually just start reducing their production of nuts. Okay. And so the problem with these producing countries right now that produce most of the coconuts for consumption by us is those countries have 80 to 100 year trees and they're all going senile. Yeah. And so, 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 it's, so I'm, it's, it's something a bit more complicated than it needs to be. You need to find a provider who knows this, who can explain this to you, and Farm Photo is one of those, because they've done this research. They know which are the high demand fruits and vegetables, where the producers and where the best place to grow it is. And then ultimately, you need to verify that those farms and where they're actually producing these are have the right data again. All right, so let's go back to the farming. Yeah. Kind of know who's buying it, you know, the price of the fruit. You need to work out where the farms are. You're going to be showing an asset. Let's verify it's the right place. For farming, you need to worry about a few things. Climate. Mm. Is there enough rainfall? Is the soil of high quality? Is there enough sunshine? So for yeah. instance, if you take citrus fruits, and I can talk to Colombia as a country in South America, a lot of the South American countries, they're amazing for agriculture because their climate is such that, you know, in the region, you know, one of my farms at behind me here, in the morning, lots of sunshine. So the yeah. sunshine can grow the fruit, become Greens animals. in the afternoon almost every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's consistent through the year. Now imagine farmland in California, massive yeah. drought from April through September, yeah. no water. You need irrigation. You need, you know, access to aquifer pumping, you know, from underground, none of that matters in South America, certain countries, yep. because they have an amazing climate for agriculture, which means there's constant rainfall, constant sunshine. And because of that, they have incredible multi-generational farming expertise. Sure. Because say you need a property manager, you need a farm manager. Yeah, yeah, and it's true. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so it's kind of like the, the big picture is look at the supply chain, Who's buying it? What price? Yeah. Where can you produce it at a lower cost and arbitrage that low cost farming to high premium price in the supermarkets that mm -hmm. you and I consume? 
I love it. And how are you getting the product into the States and, you know, qualify and all that fun stuff? Yeah. So you've got to find a company who can do it for you. And so yeah. we actually have um, pack houses. So we basically take fruit from the farms, we put it into a pack house, which means you wash it, salt yeah. it, wax it, put it in boxes, put those boxes onto pallets, put yeah. the pallets in the shipping containers, refrigerated drive the refrigerated shipping container to the port, put it on a container ship, and come across to the port of Philadelphia. Wow. Um, it's all logistics. It's all supply chain. Yeah. You need to find a company that you know, knows how to do these things. So they wax it, too. Absolutely. Wow. I didn't know that. Wax. So what kind of, on all fruit or what? It depends. I mean, so you have to think about fruit. And let's, yeah. let's, let's, look at, let's talk logistics for a second. Why are limes such a great fruit to be involved with? Because you are able to transport it. You uh, have an okay. eight to 10 week shelf life refrigerated yeah. where you can yeah, get yeah. it from the farm to you and I to eat it that day. Yeah. I thought you were going to say they're delicious with tequila. And I was like, yes, that makes I'm sense. Hungry. But I'm yeah, there, there's hungry. other reasons too. Yeah. There are. <laughs> Okay. Uh, from, a, from, from a farming standpoint, it's a great crop. Coconut's even better. Imagine trying to do that with blueberries. Yeah, or strawberries. <laughs> and, and so we as consumers are looking in the supermarket for that beautiful, shiny, gremel green lime, aren't we? Yeah. So it's a slight film of wax. The wax actually does a couple of things. A, it makes it look attractive. Yeah. But B, it allows us to wash it, wax it, make sure there's no bugs, no phytosanitary yeah. issues with it. It's fresh. And it right. It with that now you it's, can't wax organic blueberries yeah yeah you can't do that <laughs> so, so don't get into organic blueberries in the first place it's too yeah different. right you know yeah. <laughs> i mean so coconut good. you've got like nine months to get out to the store yeah yeah that's awesome i love that so talk to me i mean how profitable is this if somebody went out and got a farm what like what what type of expected costs are going to be involved in the beginning and then I know, that, you know, I ask in a really 100,000 foot view uh, type of question here, but just roughly. And then, I mean, what can somebody anticipate if they get all their ducks in a row to be able to make profit wise? So let's dive down a bit deep to what Farm Photo does, because in reality, yeah. you and me don't have access to this asset class anywhere in the world. Very difficult mm -hmm. because you need to spend several million dollars on a farm big enough that produces enough product that someone's going to buy from you. That you can't awesome. scale it. Yeah. So, you know, you can't, we have retail relationships with Walmart, Costco, Trader Joe's. I mean, these are big volume contracts. Yeah. So you and I could never do this alone. So what we do as a company is we actually have a pack house. We have two, 3,000 hectares of lime farmers sending produce to our farm. We consolidate it and then sell it into these major supply chains in the US and Europe. There it is. And the reason we're therefore able to come around and offer farmland lots to you and me, because we then go back and look at the best farms that are producing the best fruit. Yeah. We buy a farm of maybe, I don't know, 100, 120 lots, break it up into individual parcels with maybe an average of 220 trees on it. And we let you take title to the land and you receive the income from those fruit relationships. And wow. so you need really a bigger company like Farmfolio to help you do that in all Perfect. honesty. You guys heard it first. You can't do it on your own. You got to partner up with these guys. And, and if, if it's a good fit, then it makes sense. Do your due diligence. And yeah, it, it could be something that's uh, pretty dang awesome. I love that. Um, so you asked about the income level. I mean, briefly, obviously yeah. nothing's guaranteed, but the income level... So we kind of sell farm lots between 32 grand and 65 grand a piece, depending on the crop. And, and the characteristics as to what you earn depends on the crop type, as in what's the fruit you're selling, the age of the trees, the production levels, the density of planting, how many trees are on the land. There's a whole bunch of factors. So I tell people that, you know, again, follow the data, analyze that asset in, in each individual right. And you can kind of end up with single family rental returns with the right provider with that arbitrage. Okay, cool. I love it. Peter, how can people get a hold of you? 
Send me an email or go to the website. My email is peter at farmfolio.net. Happy to engage. I've got a, an ag guide. You can educate yourself. All of my learnings for the past seven, eight years. Um, and you can visit us at farmfolio.net is our website. Very awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for jumping on today. Guys, if you want to get a hold of me, you can always do so on Instagram. It's Brandon Elliott Investments. Otherwise, facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor. If you guys are looking for any done for you services for credit repair, um, then you can go to creditrepairmobile.com. Otherwise, if you're looking to check out our mastermind group for Credit Council Elite, how we're showing you how to get educated from the banks and lenders, how they're judging you so you know how to play the game, how to fix credit very, very quickly. Bankruptcies removed recently, hard inquiries, late payments, collections, you name it, in a matter of hours up to 10 business days. Or after that, getting up to the 800 Club and getting several six figures, even seven figures on business credit funding and personal, and then being able to put it to work and leveraging it to jump in and buy farms like this today, which is pretty awesome then you can check out creditcounselelite.com. That's www.creditcounselelite.com and check out our next live webinar that we have to just get more education on it. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, make sure you hit that subscribe button for the podcast today for Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing and leave a five-star review. Greatly appreciate all the feedback and love and support you guys have been uh, showering in. So appreciate you guys. We will see you on the next episode next Monday. Until next time, God bless. Peter, appreciate you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit brandonelliottinvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.